Thank you. Uh, so, hello, this is us. Um, as Keith just shared with you, I have a background uh, in fine art. My bachelor's degree is actually in fine art. Um, so I went to school for painting and, and somehow ended up here through, uh, you know, luck and hard work and um, all the rest of that. And just really excited to be able to do this and kind of bring something that has been a really enjoyable internal um, series to all the rest of you out there and connect with you in that way with something that we uh, feel really passionate about. Yeah. Plus, as a marketing person who doesn't normally get to work with consultants, I love every chance I get to work with Sarah. <laughs> um, and as Sarah mentioned, she is an artist. I'm a musician. Um, was a classical guitar minor in college for a little while, but really just kind of a jack of all trades and play a little bit of everything. Um, and those are two things that are really thought of traditionally as being creative outlets. But some of the things we're going to talk about today, uh, you're going to realize that that is uh, it's a much bigger box than that, we'll say. Amen. So uh, let's talk about today's objectives uh, and what you've gotten yourself into here by joining this webinar. Um, we're going to get into a little bit about what this presentation is and what it is not. So we have a, a helpful checklist for we you do, here. We do have a checklist. <laughs> so um, what we hope this is going to be uh, is an articulation of some, some probably self-evident and maybe some not so self-evident ideas. Um, and we want to we wanna hopefully give you guys a guide towards the end of this um, as kind of a vehicle to introduce you to how to put yourself in a creative mindset or a, I should really say, a place where the creative mindset can happen. Mm -hmm. um, this is not an instructional guide. It's not meant to be rigid. We're not here to act like we know all the answers. We're not here to lecture you and tell you you must do things this way. It's going to be different for everybody. And as you'll notice, we're going to have a lot of contradicting ideas, which just goes to show you how wide of a um, uh, net creativity casts. Uh, this is also not a recipe for banana bread. So if you receive this marketing email from Chiquita Bananas, um, you should probably sign off now and we apologize. Or stick around. Yeah, we have, you'll have fun. <laughs> You might like it. Um, so mindset, we want to start off uh, talking about how we think about creativity and ourselves and that connection there. Um, a lot of us kind of have this idea about whether or not we're a creative individual. Um, so we're going to talk through and explore a little bit of that and hopefully you'll come along for the ride with us. Yeah. So I guess we should start by defining our terms up front. What is creativity? Uh, now, the first time that we did this presentation internally, uh, we found it easier to define what creativity is not, because creativity um, is, is just so all-encompassing um, for, for so many things. Um, but since then, I found that one amazing quote that I heard from the legendary John Cleese of Monty Python, um, and for the purposes of our presentation today, we're going to define creativity the same way. So when we talk about creativity, we're not specifically talking about playing the piano or making art. We're really talking about a new way of thinking about doing something. And it doesn't have to be new to the world. It just has to be new to you, right? Because let's say you're learning how to play guitar. Whatever you're learning in your first three months is not uh, going to change the world and it's not <laughs> something no one's ever done before. Lots of people have played Smoke on the Water very poorly. Um, but it's new to you and, and it's a new way of thinking for yourself and that's really what matters. So uh, again, kind of in that theme of what creativity isn't, um, we also kind of want to debunk the idea that creativity is purely talent. Something that you either have or you don't. Uh, those two things are, are very separate. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, people kind of define their own creativity or what they perceive as a lack thereof uh, in terms of whether or not they have some natural talent for any of the classic outlets that we think of as being particularly creative. Um, and part of what we're hoping to do today is to really broaden the way you might think of or conceive creativity or define it for yourself, um, which kind of changes the yardstick, right? Uh, in a way that you could 
really benefit from. Yeah, and as you get through this, you might sit down and reflect and say, I never considered myself to be a very creative person, but in actuality, you are. So I think this is, everybody knows this quote, it's by not really Albert Einstein. <laughs> um, but I think it's, uh, it's, it illustrates a good point, um, which is that if we're specifically talking about creativity as fitting into that kind of traditional box of the arts, um, it, it's, it really doesn't fully capture um, what people are capable of. Absolutely, couldn't have said it better myself. And so in addition to that, um, I've got this theory uh, that human beings' purpose on, on Earth is not completely defined because there's such a uh, unique variation of us all across the planet. Um, it's not like we're spiders who every single one of them builds a web or all the beavers build a dam or anything. So um, my theory is that the purpose in life for a person is to innovate. Uh, and that is, that can be applied to anything. So um, you just, you don't have to be doing something um, that you're amazing at, you just have to constantly chip away and improve at something. Um, and that's kind of what I think fulfills people in life. And when we were originally putting this presentation together and Logan shared that theory with me, um, I have three young kids, it immediately made me think of this quote from Pablo Picasso, every child is an artist, the challenge is to remain an artist after you grow up. So you never see a child kind of uh, defining or confining their own creativity to these external benchmarks um, that the world kind of ends up foisting upon everyone as the, the framework by which we judge. Are we creative? Is this any good? Children are just naturally drawn to creating things, whether that's crayons or it's building my kids like to do these multi-level lego structures with roof decks and like you know they just go bonkers for it and you know no one has ever told them like oh you're not right and they don't ju judge themselves for it either exactly exactly so they're very liberated to just create because it's a natural part of being a human being yeah um so we kind of want to ask you to expand your definition of creativity because it is not just those classic arts. Um, creativity can really be anything where you're innovating or where you're making something that didn't exist before. So it can be, and I'm sure this font is very tiny for you all watching on your computers, so apologies, but it's, you know, I won't read every one of these, but it's, it, Painting, singing, yes, sure, writing, but it's also problem solving, it's gardening, it's playing an instrument, it's storytelling. Um, my husband is an amazing storyteller, like he can just come up with something at the drop of a hat. Um, he's also in an improv group, improv is creativity. Um, creating playlists, you know, like yeah. there was a time when, when a good mix CD was like, a work of art. <laughs> um, all of that stuff is making memes, parenting, creating PowerPoint presentations. All of this is creativity in action. So we would like you to ask yourselves, just kind of think about this and hold these thoughts as we go through the presentation. How do I think of myself in terms of creativity? Um, how have I been doing that for you know, my adult life? Um, and what activities do I already engage in and hopefully enjoy um, that are actually creative in nature when you think about this kind of broader, more expansive definition of what creativity is and what it can look like? Yeah, so we're not going to quiz you on this, but it's just yeah. something to think about, I think. And so now we're going to go through, and while we've kind of defined what this is, um, we'd like to get into some of the practical applications, some of the benefits, and maybe a little of of the, uh, the how-tos to get into here. Mm -hmm. So uh, we actually have a lot of research kind of out there in the world about the benefits of creative behaviors. So, um, you know, hopefully these things are enjoyable, they feel good to do. Uh, but beyond that, we know now about like really measurable benefits that creative behaviors or activities uh, bring to human beings. So that first one is brain function. Um, it actually increases the connectivity between the left and right hemispheres of your brain. 
Uh, it improves mental health by reducing depression, loneliness, anxiety, and stress. Um, in recent years, those like uh, adult coloring books have been really big. And that is absolutely a creative outlet that helps a lot of folks with their mental health. Um, and last, but definitely not least, it also improves your physical health. So uh, creative behaviors have been shown to increase immune system function, which, you know, uh, thanks to a worldwide pandemic, I think we can always use some more increased immune function. Yeah. Um, and we also kind of want to acknowledge that there is a positive feedback loop between wellness and creativity. Um, so for anyone familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's the pyramid that we see over here. Um, and it's basically the idea here is that on the bottom of the pyramid, we start out with our most basic primal needs. Y you have to have, you know, uh, psychologically uh, be taken care of. You have to feel safe. Um, and then next, you want to feel love and belonging um, through relationships with other people. Uh, esteem is about, you know, wanting to be held in good regard by others. Um, and at the very top is self-actualization, -act and that's most of where creativity uh, resides. So when we look at like past cultures um, or societies, if they were really struggling to survive, you don't see a lot of creative expression or artwork coming out of that because they just had to get by with the bare minimum and, and do what they needed to do to exist and be safe. Um, but you know, once a culture is really thriving, once a people feel safe, um, they, they have the ability to get into those self-actualization um, and those creative endeavors. Uh, but like we were just talking about with all the, the mental health and physiological benefits, um, it's, it's that positive feedback loop. So the better you feel, the more able you are to have the opportunity for creative expression and the more creative expression you're able to engage in, the better you feel. So uh, I came across this quote when we were first setting up um, this slide deck, and it really made me laugh, um, but it also struck me because there's so much, I feel like there's a really profound truth um, in this quote, and I would have attributed it, but I, I don't actually know where it came from. Um, and so uh, creativity can also help us avoid existential crisis. The quote is, the thing about knitting is it's much harder to fear the existential futility of all your actions while you're doing it. Like, okay, sure, sometimes it's hard to believe you've made any positive impact on the world, but it's pretty easy to believe you've made a sock. Look at it, there it is, put it on, now your foot's warm. I love that quote. Um, so very much like meditation, creative activities are also a great way to achieve a flow state. Um, and when we say flow state, we're talking about being completely involved in an activity for its own sake. Um, when you're kind of in this flow, the ego falls away, time seems to fly by, uh, every action movement and thought follows inevitably from the previous one without you having to really think about it your whole being is involved and you are using your skills to the utmost. So it's kind of when your mind is on autopilot and you're just, you know, you don't hear what's going on around you, you're not focused on anything else, um, and things just kind of flow. Yeah, and we're gonna get into some uh, cool details about that in a little bit. But first, um, I wanna talk about the unconscious mind, which uh, is a, it's a really interesting concept um, for creativity because that's really where creativity lives. Um, let, me, let me ask you this. I'm pretty sure everybody has had some experience in their life before where you're working on a problem, either a math problem back in school or a work problem, and you're racking your brain over it for hours and hours and hours, uh, and you can't just figure it out. And then you step away or you go to sleep and you wake up and there's the answer staring you in the face. And you said, how could I have not seen this before? It's so obvious. Well. Clearly, your mind has been working on this problem behind the scenes, even while you're not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the creativity comes in, right? 
when your mind is working on that, you don't have to do any work. But so it's it's very similar to that um, the tip of your tongue idea. So if I say, oh oh, who's my who's my coworker? It's um, it's uh, uh, and then you give up. Then you start talking about something else, and 20, 30 minutes goes by, and I blurt out, Sarah Kincannon. I had completely put that out of my mind, but my brain was working on it in the background to figure things out. So that's just a really uh, interesting way to think about creativity is it's kind of happening when you're not even trying, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's doing some of the most valuable work. Absolutely. So. Um, let's get into the how-to's a little bit. So when we talk about how we can be more creative, I want to stress that we can't teach you how to be more creative. It's Sorry. It, yeah, it's kind of <laughs> in everybody um, innately. But we can teach you how to put yourself in a place where creativity can happen. That's getting into that kind of unconscious mind. Um, and, and you need to kind of do some self-reflection and embrace that. So a uh, really cool story I heard was that Thomas Edison, obviously, uh, inventor of the light bulb and many other things, uh, found that he had his best ideas in that hazy mind state between being awake and being, in a, uh, being asleep. So every night uh, he would sit back in a big armchair, uh, he would put a glass bowl next to his chair, and he would hold some ball bearings. And he would let himself drift off to sleep. And if he got fully asleep, his hand would fully relax, and the ball bearing would drop, and it would wake him up. And he would just repeat this over and over and over again and let his brain kind of do its thing. Um, so just finding uh, through self-reflection what works best for you, how you can get into that kind of state where you feel like you're being more creative, um, I mean, it'll just do wonders for you. And there's no way to avoid it, sorry to tell you. <laughs> Um, but uh, to give you some examples, um, you, could, you can change your environments. Obviously, people are more creative in different environments. Uh, you can change your routine. You can, you can do things to improve your personal well-being, and then that kind of exponentially multiplies uh, to give you even better personal well-being. Move up Maslow's period. Exactly, yeah, right? Yeah. And so then you can go through whatever else. Um, you got to be open to new experiences, and then that kind of stretches your brain muscles out a little bit to get you into that that new and unfamiliar territory. Um, and I do want to highlight that uh, one of the really important things about creativity is to, um, to go into it with confidence uh, and, and know that you kind of have to support yourself through this. Um, if you don't know what to do, you don't know that going down a certain road is bad until you've gone down it. So you've got to approach what you do with confidence. You gotta, you've got to follow this to the end and um, good things will come out of that. Yep. Um, so now we want to talk a little bit about creativity as a process or a practice. Uh, so in that last slide, we were really talking about cultivating creativity is both uh, choosing to do things that are going to foster a creative environment or a creative friendly environment, uh, but also avoiding things that are going to kind of short circuit that ab mm -hmm. ability to be creative. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about ambition and growth work. Um, so uh, this kind of example comes from my personal background. Um, I often have an idea of what I want to do and don't feel necessarily like I am able to execute it, especially the first time around, as perfectly as I want. I'm not able to get at uh, achieving the idea that I have in my head. What I'm actually physically doing is, is falling short, and that kind of perfectionism can really kill your creativity. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that a lot of people who identify as creative people or artists have, and it's, it's this constant battle. Um, but we have to push through it. And the answer is not just to kind of abandon that creative endeavor. Um, so creativity really can be a process or a practice, and we need to think about it more that way um, than as being synonymous with some sort of God-given talent. Um, so I had a class, uh, one of my drawing classes in school, where I don't think I kept a single piece that came out of that class. It was uh, figure drawing from life. Um, and all of the work was kind of ugly 
and not you know, something that I would want to give to somebody else or hang on my wall um, or even keep around. But that's because it was growth work. And whenever I think about growth work, I always equate it to like, you know, like human beings. We're all kind of like gangly and awkward when we're teenagers, right? But that's because there's a tremendous amount of growth and change taking place between childhood and adulthood. And it's that in between where we're, we're learning, like at the speed of light, we're really coming into our own. Um, and so like that's really when you're evolving by leaps and bounds and you can't measure that progress by how perfect the work that comes out of that is. Um, so, you know, you could, if we talk about music, which is Logan's wheelhouse, you know, uh, you could take a class and be trying to write a song and what comes out of it is just a song that you think is terrible, but that can't be the measure of how much you learned through that experience, right? Because sometimes it's those experiences where we're growing the most, um, that kind of have the, the most awkward end results coming out of that because it's a, it's a stepping stone from yeah. one place to the next place that you're trying to go. Yeah, you learn the most through failing, right? Yes. So, um, so as part of this process and practice, um, something to think about, and this is probably the most contradictory thing that we're gonna talk about here, <laughs> is constraints, rules, and expectations. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna give you two examples of, uh, of ways that in my life I specifically remember being incredibly creative and I, I had um, some of the things I'm most proud of. Uh, and the, both of these, uh, actually I'm sorry, one of these has to do with music and one does not. So uh, when I took a public speaking class in college, the professor said, I have no rules and I have no expectations. And that was the entire syllabus. Um, and from that, without those kind of constraints in place, um, my mind kind of just wandered and could kind of pick up on things. Uh, you know, I would be in the shower and I'd have an idea come to me and I'd quick jump out and I'd run over to my computer and I'd write it down. Um, so having, having no constraints is, is a really amazing thing. Uh, conversely, <laughs> having constraints is a really amazing thing. So uh, when, I was, uh, when I was a little bit younger, I was playing um, in a band with a friend of mine, and he came over to my house one day, played my drum set, and he played it for a little while. Wasn't really playing that well, and he, he didn't seem happy with his performance. So what he did uh, is he took half of the drum set away and threw it to the other side of the room. And I had six cymbals and five toms and three snare drums and everything, and he took all that away and got it down to a bare bones kit. Uh, and once he did that, immediately his playing was dramatically improved. And I still haven't put the drum set together <laughs> since because uh, having, having enforced those constraints on yourself um, makes you have to figure out a more creative way to do it. So I know that was contradictory, but the point is there's value in both of those things. Absolutely, and it's really individual, right? So there yeah. are some situations or some individuals who uh, would be paralyzed by a lot of constraints. They really kind of need everything to be wide open to be at their most creative. Um, and there are also some people who are paralyzed by everything being wide open and the overwhelming amount of choice kind of at their fingertips. So yeah. yes, it seems contradictory, but both things are very, very true. Yeah. Um, and last but certainly not least, we want to talk a little bit about being guided by your why. Um, so our image here is <laughs> both ways are the right way. Um, there's no wrong way to go about it. Uh, you know, having constraints, if that works for you, great. Not having those constraints or removing them works for you great, really think about why you are trying to do a particular creative endeavor um, and kind of explore and unpack that for yourself. Uh, and then strip away anything that doesn't support that why. So uh, if you like coloring in your adult coloring book because it makes you feel more relaxed and less anxious, um, then don't get done with your page and beat yourself up about how it doesn't look perfect or you wish you'd chosen a different color for the mermaid's hair. <laughs> you know, it, it, th go back to thinking <clears throat> about like, what was I trying to get out of this process in the first place? And if you feel more relaxed, then just forget about what the end result looks like. Um, 
And also don't be holding yourself to other people's expectations. Um, you know, comparison is the thief of joy, and that's definitely as true in creative endeavors as it is in anything else. So just really identify why it is that you're trying to do what you're trying to do um, for a creative behavior or activity. Um, you know, and if it seems like maybe that's not a why that's serving you, uh, if you're maybe trying to do it to compete with somebody else or um, something that, you know, your why is maybe is not always going to be the right why, right? So just think about why you're doing it. Uh, if it's a good why, strip away everything that doesn't serve it. Um, if it's a bad why, maybe just dig a little bit deeper into that and, and come up with something else or see if you can kind of reframe that for yourself. Yeah. So um, we would not uh, do this presentation without giving a shout out to our employer, RPI, uh, which has been pretty much the greatest thing ever for creativity, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, the point is, uh, working at RPI gives us a creative outlet, um, not just in our, our own work, but um, to really be ourselves. Uh, if you can see on the page right here, this is um, some art that uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, boy. <laughs> yeah. Let's put that up right there. This is one of the most amazing. I'm, am I on? Let me on. Oh, well, give me one sec. I'm sorry. It's the last webinar of the day. We're gonna improvise here a little bit, and I'm gonna I'm gonna sneak in, steal Logan's thunder. Good. <laughs> Hi everyone. Sorry about that. No, I want to humble brag a little bit. This was put together by Minsarik and Cannon. I don't know if you can see it well there, Paul. Yep. And uh, this all started during COVID when people said, "Hey, what hidden talents?" do you have, right? And people started sharing things that they were knitting or putting together. And Sarah had this, I think it was like the first draft. It took her many months and she kept updating mm -hmm. us. And uh, even though she's the one that painted it, we all take great pride in, in that work. Yeah, this um, has been hanging up in the office for a few and, years And then now. I, just want, I just want to add, because everybody has their own nuance into this, but I think the reason, and I do believe it's an environment that fosters creativity, is because we don't do just stuff that we have to do. We stuff, do stuff that we can and we want to, right? And it's like sometimes you, you, you gotta do things just because you can, right? <laughs> anyway, yeah. sorry, I'll let, let you get back to One that. of our principles here is have fun, keep it weird, um, keep because it weird. we're encouraged to bring our authentic selves to what we do, um, and we bring that to our relationships with our colleagues and our employer, and, uh, and that's what kind of you know, led me to share that way back when it was a work in progress um, and I received a, a lot of great feedback about it and that was part of what encouraged me to, to keep going and finish it because it, it did represent hours of work and I had never done a digital artwork before. It was a completely new medium for me. Um, and who knows, you know, if I would have finished it as quickly or at all uh, if I hadn't received that kind of support and encouragement from uh, my coworkers, who are also my friends. Yeah. And now it's in our office. And it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's great. All right, so let's wrap this up here. So we have some closing thoughts. Um, a list of, we'll call them reflections, um, that we hope will be helpful for all stages of the creative journey, wherever you're at. Um, so just take a moment and ask yourself, think about your answers to these questions. Uh, what stories have I been telling myself about whether or not I'm a creative person? Are they empowering or are they limiting to me? In what ways is creativity already incorporated into my life, but maybe you haven't really been recognizing it or seeing it that way? What can I do to foster creativity or incorporate more creativity into my life? Again, we want to create that positive feedback loop between wellness and creativity. Um, what are my barriers to entry and how can I remove them or go around them? This was a huge one for me with that digital painting. Um, I have always worked on canvas with acrylic, uh, but given that I, at the time that I did that, had three kids that were <laughs> four and under, um, that was not even an option. I didn't have a space, I couldn't set it up, I couldn't you know, clean it up, I did not have the time for any of that. And so uh, being able to work in a, in a digital capacity meant I could pick it up, 
work on it for 20 minutes if I had that, and I could put it down as soon as I was needed elsewhere. Somebody wanted milk, they'd spilled crackers on the floor. You get the picture. Mom stuff. Yeah, exactly, a lot of mom stuff. Um, so that was a way that I was able to remove a barrier to entry for myself. Um, how can I be a more, con or how can I build, sorry, a more conscious practice around exercising my creative muscles? Um, again, like this is not about talent. A lot of it is about discipline and kind of making that conscious effort. Um, what does creativity require of me and what does it provide? And finally, what are the whys behind my creative pursuits and am I serving them? Yeah. And um, before we do our final goodbyes here, I'm gonna have to get a little bit creative because as the marketing guy, I forgot to get or I forgot to put some promo slides in here. <laughs> so I would like to do a couple little shameless plugs real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so coming up February 28th through March 2nd, uh, we uh, in our Baltimore office are going to be hosting an HCM road mapping festival. You can find that at rpic.com/hcmfestival. We're going to have a whole lot going on with it. Um, we're going to have some training, some um, breakout sessions, we're gonna have some sandboxes, and then we're gonna do a whole bunch of fun nightly and daily activities, including a Papa Shot basketball competition, a puppy petting station, uh, maybe some soap yeah, making, some painting, a whole lot more. Yes, uh, and Sarah's I'm, gonna come I'm and hosting do a, painting a paint workshop. night, the, yes. so the, get in on that. The, the summit we're doing because our marketing strategy is to put content in front of our customers and build relationships. So, so thank you for that opportunity. How we're going about it is we want to have fun, right? And we want to have fun with the people that are here. And so we're bringing the different talents that our folks have, like Sarah Cannon, who's graciously volunteered to lead a painting workshop. Um, and we're going to do a lot of other cool stuff. So Yeah, and we're getting very creative with uh, how we're planning this. It's a lot yes. of fun. Yeah. Uh, we're also hosting a Cloud Suite Boot Camp in our Tampa office January 24th through the 26th. Who does not want to go to Tampa uh, in January? <laughs> um, so look out for that. You can find that at rpic.com slash Cloud Suite Bootcamp. Um, that's going to be a three-day intensive, really hands-on training of the Cloud Suite system hosted by some of our uh, best and brightest that RPI has to offer. And with that, thanks so much, everybody. Thank you very much. Hope you took something away from it. And thanks for joining us in the afternoon on a Friday.